finishing up in these next couple weeks, Jeremiah. So we are in Jeremiah chapter 50 this evening. Babylon has fallen. So listen, there's a lot of scripture reading tonight. Um, so get yourself comfortable because we're going to be here for a while. Now remember, Jeremiah is doing what he was called and gifted to do. We talked Sunday about gifting. His gifting was the gift of prophecy. And God said to him, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. And so this is what God called him to do. He said, see, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10. Now, Jeremiah is not the one who's doing the destroying and the overthrowing or even the planting and the building. God is going to use other nations to do that, to accomplish his will. But Jeremiah is God's voice to the nations. And so God plucks up some, he breaks down some, he destroys some, he overthrows others, and he even builds and plants some nations. And tonight we're going to look at the overthrow of Babylon which has a, as many of the prophecies in Jeremiah does, it has a near and far-reaching prophecy. Um, there, is a, there are some verses here that speak of a destruction of Babylon that has yet to happen. And we've seen much of that, as I said, in the book of Jeremiah. And we're going to see it again in the prophecy about Babylon. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, we know, is God's servant. And God had used Babylon from the north, to bring destruction upon Judah. And God kept warning them, I'm going to bring destruction out of the north. Well, Nebuchadnezzar went too far in his cruelty toward God's people, to the destruction of God's temple and the land. And so now Babylon is going to face judgment from a nation from their north. And as we go through this judgment on Babylon, I want you to know, and because it can get very, listen, it is confusing, there is a spiritual Babylon. There is a commercial Babylon, and there is an actual Babylon. Spiritual Babylon represents man-centered religion based on the traditions and the authority of man, not God. Commercial Babylon, anybody want to take a guess? The world system, right? And, and of course, there's an actual Babylon in the land of Shinar, which is modern-day Iraq. And as I say, stated, stated rather, some of these prophecies were, are going to deal with a future judgment on Babylon and a near, around the time of Jeremiah, judgment on Babylon. So much of what Jeremiah says in this chapter um, is going to deal with spiritual and commercial Babylon, commercial more than spiritual, which I believe one day will become the commercial base for the Antichrist. We're talking about, I'm talking about the actual city of Babylon. Because if you look online, efforts are already underway to restore the ancient city of Babylon. So one day that city is going to rise up out of the desert like it did back in the day of Nebuchadnezzar. But listen, only God knows how this all plays out. Amen? So Jeremiah chapter 50, the first three verses. The word that the Lord spoke concerning Babylon concerning the land of the Chaldeans, by Jeremiah the prophet. Declare among the nations and proclaim. Set up a banner and proclaim. Conceal it not and say, now God obviously wants this message to be proclaimed throughout the land. Conceal it not and say, Babylon is taken. Bel is put to shame. Merodach is dismayed. Her images are put to shame. Her idols are dismayed. For out of the north, a nation has come up against her, which shall make her land a desolation, and none shall dwell in it. Both man and beast shall flee away. So, Lord, we lift up this study in Jeremiah to you this evening and pray, Lord, that you take whatever's confusing and, and make it straight, Lord, that you would lead and guide through this message tonight, that you would be honored and glorified through it. We ask it in your name. Amen. So verse 3 in Jeremiah 50 is a key to the rest of our text because God outlines three things that are going to happen to Babylon. First, there's going to be a nation that will come from the north against Babylon. Second, this 
this nation will make Babylon a desolation. And I want to, I don't think anyone in this room realize, knows that Babylon, you all know that Babylon is not a desolation today. So that very statement has both a near and far fulfillment. And neither man nor beast will dwell there any longer, and we know that man and beast do dwell there now. So, again, this is a future, a future uh, prophecy that's going to happen to Babylon. Um, Babylon, as I said, is modern-day Iraq, and as I also stated, it is not desolate today. It is, it is very busy there. And history shows us that it were the Medes who came from the north. The Medes were a little stronger than the Persians. The Persians came from the east, but it was the Medes and the Persians, their combined forces that came against Babylon in 539 B.C. and overthrew the kingdom. But they didn't render the land a desolation, or some translations say a wasteland. They ruled from Babylon, right? The Persians never destroyed the city because Babylon was taken by surprise. And if you remember the story, under Belshazzar, who succeeded Nebuchadnezzar, they had a huge, they were having this huge, huge, huge party in the banquet hall there. A banquet hall, by the way, that um, Saddam Hussein unearthed and was, was actually restoring. They discovered that it was 56 feet by 170 feet. So this is a massive structure. And so they're, they're in there partying while the combined forces of the Medes and Persians are outside the gate trying to take the city. Now, the reason they were having a difficult time taking the city is because those walls were impenetrable. They were 250 to 280 feet high, and they were 87 feet thick. It was said that you could race six chariots abreast around the walls of that city. It was siege-proof because there was a wall outside and an inner wall. And between those two walls, they, all their, they kept all their livestock, and they grew vegetables, so they had food source. There was also an infinite water supply as the river Euphrates ran through the heart of the city, right? So they could have survived there forever. The city was siege-proof. There were huge iron gates that also protected the city. So keep that in mind because that little detail is going to become especially important here in a few minutes. So this city is impregnable, probably one of the only cities at the time that was, or at least that's what the king and all his lords believed. You know, I could picture them all sitting around laughing as the Medes and the Persians are trying to get in, and they're failing every single time because they're behind what they believe is the most secure fortress in the land. Safe and secure, they let their guard down completely, and they get drunk, which they're oblivious now to the danger that's all around them. That very night, God writes on the wall. And he tells Belshazzar that Babylon would fall and that he would die that very night. And so Cyrus, the Persian king, had gotten tired of trying to breach the wall, so he sends a division of his very sizable army to where the river ended. And then he sends another division to where the river exited the city. And both divisions were told as soon as this river dries up, they were to enter into the city along the dry riverbed. So Cyrus takes what's left of his army, and he goes where the river ran alongside of a swamp, and they divert the Euphrates River into the swamp, which dries up the Euphrates River, which was a natural blockade against any an enemy trying to enter into that city, but now it's drained. So the army is able to walk right into the city, right underneath the gates, right in. In fact, they, they took them by such surprise that the people in the city didn't realize they had been overthrown for days. But they surround the banquet hall where Belshazzar is, and they execute him and all his lords. A day or two later, Cyrus, the Persian king, enters into Babylon, and he's greeted by, the, by Daniel as he comes in. And Daniel reads him a prophecy contained in Isaiah that mentions him by name. So 150 years before Cyrus enters into Babylon, God mentions him in the Bible. So Babylon falls to the Medes and the Persians, just as Daniel said they would in the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. Remember the dream Nebuchadnezzar had, the statue in the, in the desert, and this, this statue um, 
Daniel told him, well, the head of the statue was, was by Babylon, was gold, and then the chest and arms of silver represented the Medes and the Persians, and that Babylon would fall to the Medes and the Persians, and they did. But when, when, when they took over, they didn't destroy the city. In fact, Cyrus ruled from there. So did Darius the Mede rule from there. That's where Daniel lived for the rest of his life. And so it didn't get destroyed. The next nation that was mentioned on that statue was the middle and thighs of bronze, right? Anybody remember what that was? Alexander the Great and the Greeks, right? They conquered the Persians. They didn't destroy the city either because Alexander lived in the southern palace of Babylon and died there. So after all of that, the city wasn't destroyed. It wasn't made a wasteland as Jeremiah tells us it will be. So there's an immediate fulfillment of this prophecy with the Medes and the Persians, and there's going to be a later fulfillment of this prophecy, which will result in the complete destruction of Babylon. Or as David Gusick succinctly put it, the fall of Babylon prophesied by Jeremiah was partially fulfilled when the Medes and Persians conquered ancient Babylon. Yet the connection between this fall of Babylon and Revelation 18.2 shows that there is an ultimate fall of Babylon that has yet to come. So this prophecy speaks of a time yet to come when Babylon becomes a wasteland, when Babylon falls. And, and if you wonder what Revelation chapter 18.2 says, it says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. I'll tell you, I can't wait till we get to Daniel and Revelation. And so we will look at this a little bit more detail as we move through the message. But notice how their gods, um, they who they depended on, Merodach and Bel. Bel is Baal, and Merodach was one of their lesser gods, but they depended on them to help them against invaders. Didn't work out very well for him, did it? Look at verses 4 through 7 of Jeremiah 50. In those days and in that time, declares the Lord, the people of Israel and the people of Judah shall come together, weeping as they come, as they come rather, and they shall seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion with faces turned toward it, saying, Come. Let us join ourselves to the Lord in an everlasting covenant that will never be forgotten. My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray, turning them away on the mountains. From mountain to hill they have gone. They have forgotten their fold. <clears throat> and then verse 7 says, All who found them have devoured them, and their enemies have said, We're not guilty, for they've sinned against the Lord, their habitation of righteousness, the Lord, the hope, of their fathers. So just as the destruction of Babylon is a future prophecy, so will be the restoration of Israel. But notice restoration doesn't come without repentance. The people of Israel are weeping, and that, that indicates that they're repentant of what they had done. Paul wrote, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. The word sorrow, of course, means to grieve. And have you grieved enough over your sin to bring change? Or do we just regret what we did, right? But regret normally isn't enough to bring change. Or are you sorry that you got caught? That's not repentance. Godly sorrow over sin brings healing and change. And instead of regret, it brings freedom from condemnation. So again, Israel returns to God weeping in repentance, and that is yet to happen. When Cyrus, as a matter of fact, when Cyrus allowed them to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and the temple, only a remnant returned. Most of them stayed behind because they had already assimilated into the culture. That's how we find Queen Esther in the Bible. That, that whole story is based on that from the Jews who stayed behind. And so after they all they had been through, they still had not turned back to God in repentance, but they will. And it may take the tribulation for many, as the tribulation, as we always say, is for the salvation of the Jewish nation. And so one day, Paul tells us, all of Israel will be saved. Now, Jeremiah sees them as being led astray by the leaders of Israel because 
They had forgotten their fold, or some of your translations may say resting place. They had forgotten their resting place. They turned to their religious leaders for rest when God was their strong tower, when God was their fortress, where they could find rest under his wing. Jesus tells us all who are weary, come to him to find rest. So no matter how crazy this world gets, and it's getting crazier by the minute, we find our rest in him. I mean, Israel has been resting in God and declaring, and and the, the miracles happening there are amazing. 190 ballistic missiles, and there was one death. Uh, and, and very little destruction, that's, that's an amazing, that's an amazing hand of God. So they have found God to be their, their strong tower and their fortress. The Babylonians knew that God was using them. They knew that they were his arm of judgment against Jerusalem. But they erroneously believed that they were free now because of that. They're free to do whatever they wanted to do, to, to treat them any way they wanted. Because Judah had sinned against God. And Babylon used that as a license for cruelty against the people of Judah. But listen, only God has the right to punish his children. No one else has that right. I could spank my kids, but you better not do it, you know? And Babylon's going to find that out the hard way. Look at verse 8. Flee from the midst of Babylon and go out of the land of the Chaldeans, And be as male goats before the flock. For behold, I am stirring up and bringing against Babylon a gathering of great nations from the north country. And they shall array against her. From there she shall be taken. Their arrows are like skilled warriors who does not return empty-handed. Chaldea shall be plundered. All who plunder her shall be sated, declares the Lord. Though you rejoice, though you exalt, O plunderers of my heritage, Though you frolic like a heifer in the pasture and neigh like stallions, your mother shall be utterly shamed, and she who bore you shall be disgraced. Behold, she shall be the last of the nations, a wilderness, a dry land, and a desert. And again, that has yet to happen. Because of the wrath of the Lord, she shall not be inhabited, but shall be in utter desolation. Everyone who passes by Babylon shall be appalled and hiss because of all her wounds. Set yourselves in array against Babylon all around, all you who bend the bow. Shoot at her, spare no arrows, for she has sinned against the Lord. Raise a shout against her all around. She has surrendered, her bulwarks have fallen, her walls are thrown down, for this is the vengeance of the Lord. Take vengeance on her. Do to her as she has done. Cut off from Babylon the sower, and the one who handles the sickle in the time of harvest. Because of the sword of the oppressor, everyone shall turn to his own people, and everyone shall flee to his own land. So God tells us that Babylon is going to reap what they have sown. And he mentions he-goats here, and and that's just a reference to how a he-goat acts. And and you really have to look this up to believe it, but apparently when you the pen where you keep the goats, When you open that pen, the male goats are the first ones out the door. And so he's saying, be like the male goats. Flee. Follow them. Get out. And when we see this call to flee, also in Revelation 18. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, speaking of Babylon, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped up high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Now, if we look at this from a world system point of view, God's calling us out of this world system to be set apart. And so much, as I said, much of what we just read has yet to happen. The land still remains inhabited, and no army as to date has thrown down the walls. But the Medes and the Persians were renowned archers. So this speaks of the Medes and the Persians conquering Babylon and also speaks of a future conquest of the city because I don't believe the Persians had to unleash many arrows against the Babylonians. They just pretty much walked in and took over the city. And so it leads me to believe that Babylon will one day be rebuilt and become a commercial base for the Antichrist. And there, there may be a hint of that in a, uh, an often overlooked prophecy in Zechariah chapter 5, if you want to turn there. Zechariah chapter 5, we're just going to read the whole thing. It's only 11 verses.
to make a right out of Jeremiah. Again, I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, a flying scroll. And he said to me, what do you see? And I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits and its width is 10 cubits. And he said to me, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land. For everyone who steals shall be cleaned out according to what is on one side, and everyone who swears falsely shall be cleaned out according to what is on the other side. I will send it out, declares the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter the house of the thief and the house of him who swears falsely by my name. And it shall remain in his house and consume it, both timber and stones. Then the angel who talked with me came forward and said to me, Lift your eyes and see what this is see that this is going out. And I said, What is it? He said, It is a basket. And some of your translations may say Ephah there, but it's a basket that's going out. And he said, This is their iniquity in all the land. And behold, a leaden cover was lifted, and there was a woman sitting in the basket. And he said, This is wickedness. And he thrust her back in the basket and thrust down the leaden weight on its opening. Then I lifted my eye and saw, and behold, two women coming forward. The wind was in their wings, and they had wings like the wing of a stork. And they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. And I said to the angel who talked with me, Where are they taking the basket? And he said to me, To the land of Shinar, to build a house for it. And when this is prepared, they will set the basket down on its base. Now, as I said, the basket in Hebrew there is an ephah, which is the largest measure in, in weight. And the leaden weight were units of measures that they used as symbols of commerce. They would use those weights on the balance scale. So the woman, the basket, and the weight are all associated with wickedness. These are images of greed, of materialism, and dishonest profit, right? And so what this prophecy is saying is that God is going to cause this evil materialistic spirit to be returned to its starting place, which is the land of Shinar, Babylon, Iraq, where it would eventually be destroyed. So could Babylon become the base of the Antichrist commercial enterprises? You know, did you know that today Iraq sits on a vast oil supply, greater than that of Saudi Arabia? So that could very well be where their wealth comes from. Only, as I said, only God knows. We can't be dogmatic about any of this, but only God knows how this will end. But it's fun to go down those little rabbit trails, right, as long as we come back to reality. Verse 17. Israel is a haunted sheep, hunted sheep, rather, driven away by lions. First the king of Assyria devoured him, and now at last Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has gnawed his bones. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing punishment on the king of Babylon and his land, as I punish the king of Assyria. I will restore Israel to its pasture, and he shall feed on Caramel and then Bishan. Now, by the way, Bishan is in Jordan. Israel does not yet have that piece of land. So this, is again, is a future prophecy. And his desire shall be satisfied on the hills of Ephraim, and in Gilead. In those days and in that time, declares the Lord, iniquity shall be sought in Israel, and there shall be none. And sin in Judah, and none shall be found. For I will pardon those whom I leave as a remnant. Go up against the land of Marathium and against the inhabitants of Pekod. Kill and devote them to destruction, declares the Lord. Now, Marathium and Pekod are just outer reaches of, of the, the land of Babylon. And do all that I have commanded you. The noise of the battle is in the land, the great destruction. How the hammer of the whole earth is cut down and broken. God calls Babylon the hammer, his hammer on the whole earth. How Babylon has become a horror among the nations. I set a snare for you, and I set a snare for you, and you were taken, O Babylon, and you did not know it. Talking about the surprise invasion. You were found and caught because you opposed the Lord. The Lord has opened his armory and brought out the weapons of his wrath. For the Lord God of hosts has work to do in the land of the Chaldeans. Listen, you never want the Lord opening up his armory and coming after you. Come against her from every quarter. Open her 
granaries, pile her up like heaps of grain and devour her to destruction. Let nothing be left of her. Kill all her bulls. Let them go down to the slaughter. Woe to them, for their day has come, the time of their punishment. So God mentions two lions here used as judgment against Israel and Judah. And first, it was the Assyrians that came and took the northern kingdom of Israel captive. Then the Babylonians came and took the southern uh, kingdom of Jerusalem captive. And he, and he So he uses a picture of a lion that when a lion kills its prey, it usually breaks its bones and then it's, gnaw, you know, it's picking its teeth with their bones. Not a very pretty picture. But he also uses a picture of a hammer as Babylon is the hammer upon the whole earth. And, and I think this is a, uh, is a, it's a warning for America as well. Because even though God had used Babylon as his hammer of judgment, Babylon's going to feel God's hammer upon them. And America, with the world's most powerful army, has been used, I believe, as a hammer of God upon this earth for righteousness. But America one day will face the hammer of God's wrath for our sins as a nation. You know, the time has come, I believe, to stop praying for this nation, as God told Jeremiah to do about Judah. As for you, do not pray for this people, or lift up a cry or prayer for them. Do not intercede with me, for I will not hear you. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 16. <clears throat> you know, Billy Graham famously said, if God does not judge America, then he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah, and God does not apologize. Now, our nation, I believe, has reached the point of no return. I think we've, we've reached that point where prayer doesn't even help our nation anymore. However, we must continue to pray for, we, we can't, I don't think, I think the nation is beyond help. However, we continue to pray for the people of America. We, we pray for them to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And notice, no matter what Israel had done, and they had done plenty, there's forgiveness in the Lord. The psalmist wrote, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins. Thank God for that. Nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. In that day, when Israel turns back to God, they will be pardoned. And by the way, anyone who turns to God today, who turns to Jesus Christ, who puts their trust in him, will be pardoned. Their sins will be forgiven as far as the east is from the west. Verse 28 to 32. A voice they flee and escape from the land of Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God, vengeance for his temple. Summon archers against Babylon, all those who bend the bow, encamp around her. Let no one escape. Repay her according to her deeds. Do to her according to all she has done, for she has proudly defiled the Lord, defied the Lord, rather, the Holy One of Israel. Therefore her young men shall fall in her squares, and her soldiers shall be destroyed on that day, declares the Lord. Behold, I am against you, O proud one, declares the Lord God of hosts. Make note of that verse, verse 31. For your day has come, and the time when I will punish you. The proud one shall stumble and fall with none to rise him up, and I will kindle a fire in his cities, and it will devour all that is around him. So Babylon was burned. Um, well, Babylon, I'm sorry, Babylon burned the temple and the city in 587 B.C. In, in Jerusalem. And God is going to execute vengeance upon them for their actions. And what, what, what drove them, what, what caused them to do what they did was pride. They felt, they believed they were unstoppable. Even God of heaven wasn't going to stop them. And Scripture tells us that pride goes before the fall, Right? that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. However, I believe that these verses we just read could also be a foreshadowing 
of the Antichrist himself. Verse 33. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the people of Israel are oppressed and the people of Judah with them. All who took them captive have held them fast. They refuse to let them go. Their Redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He will surely plead their case that they may give rest to the earth, but unrest to the inhabitants of Babylon. A sword against the Chaldeans, declares the Lord, and against the inhabitants of Babylon and against her officials and her wise men. A sword against the diviners, that they may become fools. A sword against her warriors, so that they may be destroyed. A sword against her horses and against her chariots and against all the foreign troops in her midst, that they may become woman. A sword against all her treasures, that they may become plundered. A drought against all her waters, that they may be dried up. For this is the land of images, and they are mad over idols. So I love these verses. You know, we, we say all the time we struggle with sin, we struggle with sin, we struggle with sin. And we really don't have an excuse to struggle, struggle with sin because God tells us that our Redeemer is stronger than any struggle we're going through. Amen? And I love verse 37. And, it, and he's, God's not condoning men becoming women here. What he's saying is that when that battle comes, when that day comes, when that destruction comes, men will flee the battle like a woman. Sorry, God said that, not me. God is not politically correct. Verse 39 to the end. Therefore wild beasts shall dwell with hyenas in Babylon, and ostriches shall dwell in her. She shall never again have people nor be inhabited for all generations, as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring cities, declares the Lord. So no man shall dwell there, and no son of man shall sojourn there. So obviously that has not happened. Behold, the people comes from the north, a mighty nation, and many kings are stirring from the furthest parts of the earth. Again, the Medes were the furthest north, and they came with the Persians. It was only two kings. This talks of many kings in that day. They lay hold of the bow and the spear. They are cruel and have no mercy, which is exactly what Babylon did. They're, reap, they're going to reap what they sowed. They, the sound of them is like the roaring of the sea. They ride on horses, arrayed as a man for battle against you, O daughter of Babylon. The king of Babylon heard the report of them, and his hands fell helpless. Anguish seized him, pain as of a woman in labor. Behold, like a lion coming up from the thicket of the Jordan against a perennial pasture, I will suddenly make them run away from her, and I will point over her whomever I choose. For who is like me? Who will summon me? What shepherd can stand before me? Therefore hear the plan that the Lord has made against Babylon and the purposes that he has formed against the land of the Chaldeans. Surely the little ones of their flock shall be dragged away. Surely their folds shall be appalled at their fate. At the sound of the capture of Babylon, the earth shall tremble, and her cry shall be heard among the nations. You know, we, 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 we fret over this coming election, and God tells us right here that he is going to place who he wants in office that he had a plan for Babylon. God has a plan for the United States of America. And, of course, this destruction has yet to happen. Sod um, Babylon was never completely destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah was. So this, is, obviously, is a future prophecy that refers to the actual city of Babylon and what it represents. And as I said earlier, Babylon represents there's a spiritual Babylon, there's a commercial Babylon, and then there's the actual city of Babylon. So please turn, and we're going to close with this, Revelation chapter 18. We're going to read verses 9 through 19. And the kings of the earth, and we're talking about Babylon now, the great Babylon, who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her, will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon. For in a single hour 
your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her, since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet, cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots and slaves, that is, human souls. And one sad thing here is there won't be any more pumpkin spice. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and all your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants, God is going to destroy this world system completely. The merchants of those wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off, in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels, and with pearls. For in a single hour all this wealth has been laid waste. All the shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and all whose trade is on the sea, stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth, for in a single hour she has been laid waste. Now this prophecy refers to commercial Babylon and all those who have put their trust in this world system. Now those who have come out of this world system, believers, and put their trust in Jesus, in the tribulation, we're going to rejoice at the fall of Babylon. But not everyone is going to be happy to see it destroyed. Those who have gained the world but have lost their souls in the process are going to weep and lament at the destruction of this world system. In one hour, her fate would be sealed. One hour is a Hebrew idiom for how quickly this corrupt system will be put down. So the question becomes, what are we trusting in? What are we trusting in? You know, I've told this story before, so I apologize if you've heard it before, but you know, I, I was blessed at a time to be able to teach at the Atlantic City Rescue Mission, which is the largest rescue mission on the East Coast. And I used to give a message with the belief that all those people, all those homeless people listening, were just drug-addicted sinners and needed to be warned of the judgment to come, right? How arrogant was I? Then one day, as I was about to ask those gathered there that day to raise their hands if they wanted to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and as I'm praying, the Lord just put on my heart to, to ask instead how many in that room are already saved. I'm like, okay, Lord. Sounds like a crazy question, but I'll ask. To my shock, almost three-quarters of that room raised, raised their hand. Listen, they were sinners, just like me, but they were not lost nor would they be judged by God for their sin because Jesus had already pray, paid the price of their sin for them. And here's the point of that story. They were homeless. They're living in a shelter. Everything they own, they carry in a plastic bag. Yet they came there every single Saturday to worship the Lord. Their devotion was Him wasn't based on what they had or, or how He had blessed them materially. materially. They were devoted to him because they loved him despite their circumstances. And I'll tell you, I was never more humbled in my faith than that. And, it, and it's caused me to, as I reflect on it now, it caused me to reflect on that and ask myself, what if I lost everything? Everything. Would I be able to say like Job said, shall I accept only good from God and not adversity also? How would I react? I mean, would I continue to trust God, continue to serve him, if I lost everything, listen, there is a storm coming. And you can call it the New World Order. You can call it the Great Reset. You can call it whatever you want. It's called the Tribulation, but it's coming. And if your foundation with Jesus is rock solid, then you're going to be able to weather any storm that comes. If they close down the ports, if they put more restrictions in place, it doesn't matter. If your foundation is built on that rock, you will withstand with stand rather any storm that comes at you but if it's a weak foundation built on the shifting sands 
because you've neglected that relationship for years while you've put everything else in your life as a priority over your relationship with Jesus Christ. And when that storm comes, just as Jesus said, you are in danger of falling. Falling for the lies and deception the God of this world is putting out there. Now is the time to make sure that your foundation in Jesus Christ is sure, that it's on, built on the rock, and put your trust in him for what lies ahead. So getting back to this text in Revelation, there are 28 commodities represented here and seven industries that make up this world system in commercial Babylon. And they are as follows. The first industry is trade, gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls. These precious commodities represent our commodities training, trading system. It's all going to be wiped out. It's all going to be destroyed. People who have invested heavily in commodities over the years. Uh, <clears throat> just the global gemstone market alone is a $23 billion a year in this industry. People have stored up treasures and trusted their futures to gold, silver, and precious stones instead of trusting in God. And all of that's going to burn up. It's, it's, there's no future in that. The only future is placing your trust in Jesus Christ and having eternal life in him. Anything we gain on this earth is going to burn up. It's going to die. You know, there's an old saying, there's no U-Hauls behind a hearse, is there? No matter what you gain in this life, you can't take it with you. We need to invest in the kingdom of God and secure our eternal life with him because gold, silver, pearls, and gemstones are all going to burn up in the end. This, free, this, this, this system of free trade and commercialism is not going to endure forever. People think it will, but it's not. But you and I are guaranteed a future and an eternity with Christ Jesus that will last forever, that will have no end. You know, when the, when the angel announced the birth of Jesus, he said to Mary, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Jesus will rule over Israel, and his kingdom in heaven will have no end. You know that not everyone, or I'm sorry, everyone does live into eternity. You know that, right? I want you to listen closely to the words of Daniel. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Everlasting contempt. Jesus gave John a vision of the judgment of those who, who died without knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things that, which were written in the books according to to their deeds. Can you imagine God keeping a record of everything you do as a non-believer? If I hadn't accepted Christ, they didn't have to back a semi up with all the records of my, my me. Without Jesus, you're going to stand before a perfect, holy, and just God, and you're going to have to explain to him why you did not need the forgiveness of his son, why you rejected the salvation of the cross. And at that point, you have no recourse. You have no representation. You're going to be found guilty of your sin, and you're going to spend eternity separated from God. And that is the, that is the, uh, the, the nice uh, way to say that. The where you'd spend eternity depends on who or what you've placed your trust in. The second industry is textiles, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet. You know, the textile and apparel industry in the United States alone is a $70 billion a year business. To some, investing in clothes and shoes is as addictive as investing in the stock market. They've invested in this materialistic world and have neglected the kingdom of God. The third industry mentioned here in Commercial Babylon is construction. Citron wood, precious wood, ivory, bronze, um, iron, and marble. Now, citron wood was a precious wood. It was a luxury item. And, and these were all expensive imports that were imported to build exclusive homes. Some of these homes would have marble bathrooms, ivory tables, bronze fixtures, high-end furniture, right? This exists today. These building materials 
would be used to build and furnish a home where money is no object. Listen, in the end, the only building material that's going to matter is what your life has been built on. Is it built on the rock or on the sand? The only building material that's going to matter in the end is if Jesus is the chief cornerstone of your life. The fourth industry is fragrance. Cinnamon, incense, fragrant oil, and frankincense. The global fragrance industry generates about $31 billion a year, possibly more by now. And ultimately, all that's going to be wiped out. No perfume, no cologne. Listen, the tribulation is going to be a smelly place. It's all going to be destroyed. Therefore, the most important fragrance we can wear now is the fragrance of Christ. We have victory in Christ Jesus. And as such, we are to be the aroma of life and of victory in Christ to all those around us so that they smell that aroma on us and want what we have. The fifth industry mentioned here is the food industry. Wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, and sheep. So goodbye, Texas Roadhouse. Goodbye, Mission Barbecue, although I do believe there are Mission Barbecues in heaven because eating at Mission Barbecue is like eating in heaven. But the global food industry is estimated to generate about $931 billion a year, and that's projected to 2027. Food is an essential part of life, but many have become enslaved to it or addicted to it or have been hurt through it, by it rather, through anorexia and bulimia. And those disorders alone cost millions of dollars every year, not to mention the diet and weight loss industry that has grown because of our addiction to food, which is worth about $72 billion a year. But Jesus tells us, don't worry. Don't worry about what you wear. Don't worry about what you eat. Don't worry about those things. He's got us. He is the bread of life. All that we need to sustain us, he provides us. And all that we need, we find in him. The sixth industry mentioned here is labor, labor and transportation, horses and chariots. Goodbye railroad, goodbye over-the-road trucks, goodbye shipping and planes. Transportation industry is what keeps the wood and the food and the clothes and all our essential items moving, right? And so we saw during the virus what, sh- what a shortage looks like. You know, the, the supply chain, we were told, was, it was a problem. And, and now with the, the ports shutting down, It's going to create another supply chain issue. But in the end, every means of moving goods throughout the world is going to be destroyed, ending global trade for good. Now, we spend billions every year just transporting goods around the world when the most important commodity we have as believers is the message of the gospel. And we're blessed to be able to deliver that message that can set a hearer free from their enslavement to the world system from sin in this world. And the seventh industry here is the saddest of all. It's the human slave trade. It's bodies and souls. And it speaks of the merchants of the earth, on the earth that engage in the commodity of human beings. Human trafficking has become a plague upon society. Children are being deceived, coerced, and forced into the sex trade. It has become a $150 billion business. Is it any wonder why no one has put an end to this yet? It targets girls, especially between the ages of 11 and 14. Another sex trade commodity is prostitution. Prostitution worldwide generates $186 billion. Pornography is an offshoot of sex trafficking. And although many willingly participate in that, There are some who are forced into it. The pornography industry has generated another $97 billion worldwide, and they're all linked together, obviously. But just let me say this. If you are supporting pornography in any way, you are supporting the sex trafficking of children. Did you know that 76% of all sexual transactions with young females begin online? Predators connect with these girls online, and then try to coerce them to come outside where they're waiting to kidnap them. For boys, it's online gaming. Again, predators will lure young boys away by pretending to be someone else in these games. 
Now think about the virtual world that these kids are in daily with online learning with iPads and smartphones, right? You know, we lock the doors to our homes. We guard our kids. We make sure we know who they're with and where they're at for fear they're going to fall prey to a sexual predator. But yet we hand them devices devices rather that allow these predators access into the homes where they live. So you must always be vigilant. The enemy is crouching at the door, around the corner, waiting to pounce. And so what do all these commodities have in common? Money. Mammon. There, there's, these are multi-million, billion-dollar businesses. And because they generate so much money, people will do anything, including lying, cheating, stealing, kidnapping, even murdering to keep it going. People have either become enslaved to them or are enslaved by them. Now, sadly, we're not going to see an end to this until it is destroyed just before, completely destroyed before Jesus returns. What their souls long for? Wealth, security, peace of mind is gone. It's no more. Commercial Babylon has fallen. And when it falls, it will fall for good. There won't be any banks to bail it out. There won't even be any banks. Wall Street will be gone. Morgan Stanley will be gone. The Barclays will be gone. Deutsche Bank will be gone. Goldman Sachs will be gone. Better get your investments out now. In one hour, it will be gone. The kings, the merchants, the shipmasters, and all the sailors will stand back and see the smoke rising from the ruins. They've lost everything. They've lost their fortunes, their homes, their dreams. What they've worked all their lives to build up, all the treasures that they've accumulated here on earth while neglecting God and the things of God will be gone in a heartbeat. And so they lament, what is like this great city? That means there's nothing like her and that she can never be replaced. When you're enslaved to this world, you know nothing else but this world than the things of this world. And in one hour, all that the inhabitants of this world have trusted in will be no more. But heaven and earth, or heaven rather, and eternity with Jesus will never end. What have you placed your trust in? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your prophet Jeremiah and the words that you